So the next segment in historical geology environment chapter uh, is starting with the temperate forest. Uh, and that is uh, basically our climate zone. You know, we are right here. So it's this area. And I mean, you can see it in Europe and uh, Asia and even in the south of all. So the temperate forest. So you know everything about it. Um, among some pine trees in the temperate forest, we mostly have maple and oak trees. Uh, the ground animals are very, very diverse. Uh, and the birds are especially very well presented and it's very diverse also. Uh, because of the climate is rather humid, the, the chemical weathering is more intense, so we have very well developed soil zones. And this is just a picture of temperate forest. And here we are at the evergreen forest, it's north of the temperate forest. Uh, so it's in Canada mostly. When we have evergreen forest, that just means that uh, the climate is a little bit cooler than in the in the temperate forest. We have mostly uh, pine trees in this zone. The summers are relatively short, so you have to think about Canada mostly, and the the, the winter months are much longer. Um, the pH of the soils here, because of the presence of the pine, the pine is, as the low needles uh, fell down onto the gro ground, they make the soil rather acidic. So the in the pine trees, you won't have much uh, undergrowth because they don't, most plants don't like the acid, acidic soil. Uh, it has pretty good chemical weathering and physical too, so the soils are relatively thick and, and pretty okay, except that they are acidic. The next climate zone is north of the uh, pine forest zone, which is the evergreen, of course, is the tundra. The tundra is um, like northern Russia, that area right here, and northern Canada. When you're on the tundra, basically the, the everything is like belongs to the permafrost. That just means that only the top part of the soil uh, melts during the summer and all during the winter it's all frozen and the winter is much much longer than the summer so what we have on the tundra is not very much the temperature is pretty cold uh, and a lot of the the soil is, is as I said permafrost so it, it stays frozen all the time the plants are very low and they do not need too much uh, water, mostly mosses, sedges, light lichens, and a very, very low growing trees, just like you can see on these pictures. Uh, the diversity is very low, uh, and the, the physical and chemical weathering is very low. And, um, Everything is mostly from grass. And the next one is the polar region. The polar region, of course, is in the uh, poles, around the poles. Uh, and you know, there is absolutely nothing at the polar region. So uh, basically, the diversity is non existent. Um, we have two ice caps, one is uh, Antarctica and the other one is Greenland and the life is very very scattered, almost no plants. I always pull it up, I don't like that. Just a few animals, uh, not very many things can survive this cold climate. <clears throat> there is no weathering and no soil, so this is pretty uh, harsh environment. And this is just a couple of cute pictures of penguins. And it's cute. One thing I want you to Im uh, remember that there is no such a thing that ice forms in the sea. 
it has to have a land and the ice will grow from the land into the ocean so make sure that you understand that and now the next things we have to talk about is is just to understand why did I why did we have to go through all this why is it so important to interpret rocks and fossils and um, it is very important because as you know the plants and animals are very very sensitive to environmental changes so they are very very good climate indicators uh, and they geologists often use uh, fossil plants or animals to study climate uh, just one example like if you think of the reptiles um, and you have fossil reptiles that you know and what kind of climate did you have to have? What kind of animals do reptiles are? What do they do during the cold weather? You're right, they hibernate. So if it was always cold, what would happen? You're right, they would never stop hibernating. So therefore they couldn't eat, they couldn't uh, reproduce. And so therefore we know if you have... Uh, reptile fossils or re really uh, mammals, a lot of the mammals hibernate do during the winter, then we would know that there was no winters at all. Um, or if there was winter, it wasn't such a long winter like, like in the polar region. So we know uh, about the seasons and environments by just using the fossil record. So we just finished this and now we're going to go through the marine environment and then the, the continental environments. So start with the, with the marine realm we call, uh, it's basically the ocean basins and we know that these are uh, very important because most of the sedimentation is going to settle down forever into the ocean. And this is where not only the sediment will settle down, but the, the, the living things have the best chance to become preserved. Uh, the depth of the sea is usually between 0 to 10 kilometer, and most of the sea floor lies between 3 to 6 kilometer below, below the sea level. And now we're going to talk about the environment of the oceanic, the oceanic environments, I should say. We have to talk about the continental shelf, barrier islands, continental slope rise, the abyssal plain, and the trench. So let's start with the continental shelf. The continental shelf is, is basically, <clears throat> if you go to Virginia Beach, and you walk into the ocean, that very shallow part of the water is what we call continental shelf. Basically, it goes from the, where the water starts to the so-called shelf edge. Interestingly, below the continental shelf, we still have uh, continental crust. So this is all continental crust right here. So the shelf break is the, is the place where actually the ocean really starts. So if you look at the Atlantic Ocean, uh, this here is the continental shelf, right Right here. You know, where you see the, the slope starts going down really quickly. That's the continental shelf. Continental shelf, remember. This yellow shows you all the continental shelves at the world. So you can see that there is a lot of it. Now, around the shelf, continental shelf, very important uh, feature is the barrier island. Usually it, it occurs around the, the sea margins, and they are uh, frequently formed by the, by the longshore current and the wind, of course. Behind the barrier island, you have the lagoons. Take on this figure right here. Uh, or also could be marshes. And these areas are very populated with animal and plants, uh, especially in warmer climates. And uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a humid environment, the, the, a lot of coal formation would happen around here, especially uh, 
closer to the equatorial region or mid-latitude actually. I'm saying the equatorial, like Everglades is one of the best place where you can imagine coal formation. But also if you go up to North Carolina, South Carolina or Virginia, we have these kind of areas where coal formation are uh, uh, possibilities. The next one is the continental slope and the continental slope is this area right here the continental slope. Um, the sedimentation is not really happening on the continental slope because the sediment just actually goes down right here. So it is just a severed uh, continuation of the uh, continental shelf. So this is the slope and the lower part of it is the rise. So you have to know this is the slope rise and this is the abyssal plain. But first, uh, we're going to look at the continental slope right here. The Atlantic Ocean, that's the continental slope right there. And this is the continental rise. I already showed you this area right here. Uh, and uh, below the continental rise is the abyssal plain, abyssal plain. This is the open water environment, basically. Now here we have to talk about the photic zone. The photic zone is the upper level of the ocean where the light can penetrate. Usually it's about 100 to 200 meter. And there is a lot of um, animals and plants which only can live in the photic zone. One of the best examples for this is the coral reef. So anytime you see coral fossils, you know that that had to be in the photic zone. So just a little bit about the marine life. Um, if you think about uh, how hard it is to live somewhere um, like just think about how, where would it be the hardest to live like next to the continent or in the deeper water and I mean of, of course you can read it on the slide so at the near land zones are the hardest where do you think it is and I mean it says right here that the reason is because you have very high energy, lots of wave action, which breaks up skeletons and so. And also the temperature is changing a lot. And also the salinity. Whenever you have rain, because the water depth is small, it makes the salinity um, less. And whenever there is no rain, the salinity is increasing. And most animals are very sensitive for this kind of changes. So therefore, in the, in the coastal areas, the diversity is relatively low. And when you go into deeper ocean, the conditions are more stable, so more sensitive animal with nicer ornamentation on their skeletons can live. So let's talk about the marine life habitat. First thing I wanted to mention to you is the, the low teeny tiny organisms which floating on the surface of the ocean. They are in the in the photic zone mostly and we call them plankton. Plankton. The planktons are animal uh, the planktons are teeny tiny one cell organisms and we have two major groups. The ones which are photosynthesize and we call them phytoplanktons. And the other one, which feeds on the phytoplankton, is the zooplankton, which are animal life like, and they will actually eat the zooplanktons, which are making food for them. So, this is a couple of phytoplanktons. And the other group, as I said, the, the one which are feeding on the phytoplanktons are the zooplankton. And, uh, some of the, the animals can swim and uh, most of them just kind of drifting with the flow. 
uh, the Necton is the the part of the ocean where all the swimmers are around so they can actually distribute really good they can move independently then they are not on uh, in you know they are not the plankton see that the planktons by the way the zoo and the phytoplankton so the necton is all the animals who can independently move around and they are not relate to the drifts of the ocean so they can they can move around that's the nectar and these are the different animals of the nectar and the plankton and the nectar together is called pelagic life make sure that you remember this because i might ask it on true false questions so you should know uh, this here just shows you the the different parts of the like the the slope the rise and the abyssal plane and uh here is the photic zone that's the pelagic zone right there and the bentos is the type of living thing which are living attached they are they have to be attached to the sea floor so that these are the marine life habitats And now we are at the distribution of marine life, which is depend on the limiting factors such as the temperature. And you know that there is a bunch of marine life habitats which are belong to different climate zones, such as the corals. We know or that they can only live in tropical zones. The next limiting factor is the salinity of the seawater, uh, and the the salt content of the natural seawater is about 35 parts per thousand so it's basically 3.5 percent if if the salinity is much lower than that we call the water brackish and if it's much higher we call it hypersaline just remember this hypersaline and brackish brackish is the low salinity and the hypersaline is the high salinity So this slide shows how the salinity happens. The this is where um, so that's how the the sodium and the chlorine uh, and the water molecules relate to each other. So the when you have the positive sodium, then the negative part of the water molecule, which means the oxygen side, is attracted to them just like this, and then on the chlorine. The, the hydrogen side of the water molecules will uh, will touch because because the the hydrogen side of the water molecule is more positive so therefore it goes close to the to the chlorine this this here shows you what else is in the seawater right here so there is magnesium and a lot of uh, calcium potassium and then there are some trace elements we have bicarbonate um, this slide shows you the distribution and the changes in the salt content as you go um, from the tropical areas this is the tropics right here and you know where we have the rainforest this slide shows the evaporation salinity I have to see because I okay so the blue curve is the evaporation and the gray curve is the precipitation and down here is the salinity so you can see wherever we have the rainforest the salinity is um, lower because we have a lot of fresh water coming in and at the tropical desert the, the salinity is higher because because the evaporation rate is high so the evaporation rate is high right here and the precipitation rate is low whereas the evaporation rate is low and the precipitation rate is high at the rainforest I have to stop so we'll continue